to repeat the whole journey. Do the 29 words come first? And that informs the consciousness, the phenomenological consciousness of the Eskimo to see 20, to distinguish 29 categories. Or non-linguistic practices come first. Hunting, finding your way in a storm, scouting, building igloos, differentiation, differentiating different types of snow, <coughs> telling your children things like, don't eat the yellow snow. Because <laughs> you never know how it became yellow. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and then, when something becomes extremely important in your life and in your livelihood, synonyms begin accumulating. Synonyms for snow. And synonyms, in order to stay in a language, not to disappear after several generations, begin to acquire subtler shades of meaning, begin to mark subtler differences between different combinations of, of ice, snow, and water. And eventually, you end up with 29 words for snow. It's two very, very different things. In one word, privileging linguistic practices. Linguistic practices of classification. It is classification what matters. And if we have the categories under which we classify things, therefore we can perceive those things. In the other, we're privileging non-linguistic practices, which is everything else, hunting, eating, gathering, surviving, building. And the words, of course, do exist and are important, or an, are an aid in, in, in non-linguistic practices, are a teaching aid, are a mnemonic aid, are a way of remembering, but not at all the source of the structure of perception. Now this question, which one comes first, the non-linguistic practices or the linguistic practices, should be able to be settled relatively unproblematically. Language is at most 40,000 years old. It is dated at the most to the transition between the Middle Paleolithic and the Upper Paleolithic. However, Homo sapiens has been in this planet, even if we don't include Homo erectus and all our other <coughs> primate uh, uh, ancestors, this Homo sapiens that we, we would be able to have mate with and have babies with is the same species, 250,000 years old. At least it coexisted with Neanderthals in, in the Levant and the Middle East, it replaced Neanderthals in Europe, but for at least 200 years, that Homo sapiens was working with his hands, was intervening in reality, was creating weapons, was passing traditions to his, to his children without uttering a single word. You know, are we really to suppose that they were in a flux of perceptions, that they couldn't really find their way because they didn't have words to classify things. So one would think that the issue would be settled already. The problem is, it's far from settled. And it's far from settled because Kant won over Hume back in their time, simply in terms of prestige, and Neo-Kantianism took over the 20th century. You cannot swing a dead cat in the middle of a city without hitting a phenomenologist or an idealist. <laughs> <coughs> so let's start defining in a little more detail what the two positions are. And let's begin with Kant. Again, when you read Deleuze's uh, uh, book on Hume, uh, Empiricism and Subjectivity, he begins by saying, the history of philosophy gives us, gives us a very impoverished version of what Hume is. He gave, it bases everything in his epistemology, the idea that the foundation of all knowledge can be reduced, can be to sense data. And that everything else you know, can be logical derivations of things that we have directly observed. That empiricism, of course, eventually became positivism, and it is a very impoverished version of what epistemology is. Epistemology is more, particularly even in science, is much wider than that. And yet Hume is now saddled with this idea that that, is, that that was his main idea, that that was his main contribution to say that the foundation of knowledge is empirical observation. So Deleuze begins his book by saying, forget about the history of philosophy. The history of not, not forget about 
philosophers in history, but forget about those books that are called history of philosophy, because they tend to, to reduce philosophers to slogans, slogans good for t-shirts, slogans good for bumper stickers, since they are the foundation of all knowledge. Catchy slogans, but that give you an impoverished version of what a philosopher's worldview was. And in particular, it says, because Hume gave us something way more important than that already obsolete foundationalist epistemology. He gave us a theory of the subject, a theory of subjectivity. Now, before I to contrast it with the more uh, classical version, let me first say what subjectivity would be, would be for something like Kant. And if there are any Kant experts in the audience, you are going to have to forgive me for the fact that I need to go a little fast, and therefore it's going to sound slightly oversimplified. But the main idea is this. When I look at that object in front of me right there, I look at a certain combination of you know, wood, look wood colored things in a particular shape, in a particular disposition. But I don't know, I don't understand that it's a chair unless I know the meaning of the word chair. And I know that the general category chair encompasses that object. In other words, that object belongs to the category chair. That's the way in which I can make sense of this patchwork of sensations is by constantly classifying things under linguistic or conceptual categories. For Kant, many of these con conceptual categories were not conventional. For instance, causality. He did not think that causality was a mere convention. But as I said, the moments of zero signifiers, the arbitrary of the signifiers, was, was joined to the thesis of the linguisticality of experience, we ended up with neo-Kantianism. The best example of neo well, I mean, there are many examples of neo-Kantianism, as I just said, the world is packed with them. But the best example, probably the one that made the most impact on the public imagination was Thomas Kuhn. Thomas Kuhn is, of course, a famous historian of science who first began, propag began propagating the following idea. If Eskimos see 29 kinds of snow because they have 29 words for snow, it means that someone who doesn't have those 29 words won't see the same kinds of snow. In other words, every culture, in a way, having its own vocabulary, having its own, its own uh, semantics, will cut out the world in an entirely different way. And so every culture, in a sense, lives in its own world. If the, wor if, 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 if the world is linguistically structured, then we know because of all the work by linguists in the 20th century, how varied languages are, how varied vocabularies are, it follows that every culture lives in its own world. And so Kuhn said, well, so are scientists, or so do scientists. Scientists with the vocabulary of classical physics live in, in one paradigm, live in one world, and scientists with the vocabulary of quantum physics or relativistic physics live in an entirely different world. In fact, as he said, there's incommensurability among those paradigms, and there is a there is a barrier to communication between scientists in different fields because each one is living in its own world. A paradigm shift, this was the most important notion of Kuhn that became so popular that even people in the news and in magazines now you find that notion, is precisely this dislocation in communication in a scientific culture. When a paradigm shift occurs, young people adopt a new paradigm, they now cut out the world and live in a completely different world than their elders, and there cannot be any communication between them. The question is, is that true? When one examines the, the, the history of German uh, physics between 1890 and 1920, do we really find that breakdown in communication? in which Lawrence would not be able to speak with Einstein, or Einstein would not be able to speak to Perrier, or in which a, classic, a classical physics would not be like Maxwell, would not be able to communicate with someone like Heisenberg? No, we don't. Yes, there were discrepancies, and yes, they were trying to figure out, hey, why do things begin starting at 10 minus 13 centimeters, that tiny little Planck scale at which atoms operate, weird things are going to happen down there because well, weird things happen when things are very, very small.